Alpha Team report. You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. Read like the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in Bourne. He will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the law. We enforce it. And at the end of the day, each and every member can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. It is December 14th, 2016, and we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, my fucking sound isn't where it should be, but uh, thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Oh, that's why. <laughs> we're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 6 o'clock Pacific. Nine o'clock Eastern on the nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen live on the live stream at nonpartisan Liberty for All and on Spreaker and listen to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, SoundCloud. Stitcher and iTunes on nonpartisan liberty for all. We promote self ownership in the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and uh, violence. I've been messing with, uh, one point I did something where I was trying to fix something and the sound got fucked up and I've never got it back to exactly where I wanted it. I've gotten it close and I keep going back and forth with, you know, sometimes it's a little too high, sometimes it's a little too low. And I'm trying to get that perfect sound that I had. Like I can go back and listen to shows when I first started, um, with the new equipment I've got and the sound was just perfect. And I mean, it's still uh, really good, um, but it's just not exactly where I want it to be at. I want it to be what I would consider as perfect as it can be based on the equipment that I have. So I was kind of a little distracted by that there, but I think we're good. And I listened back to yesterday's show. The thing is too, is that, you know, you have all these devices, so I can listen to it on a computer on YouTube, and then I can listen to it on my phone, and I can listen to it uh, through Spre Spreaker on a computer or through the uh, my actual website. So there's so many different ways to listen to it, and you're like, okay, what should I go by? Because I can't actually hear what's coming through Spreaker. Otherwise, my voice would be in delay. I can just hear what's coming through the mixer and make sure that that sounds uh, good. So sorry for the whole uh, thing on sound, but that might be helpful for any of you that do podcast. I never realized how important sound was until I moved from... Um, blog talk radio to Spreaker. And also I bought uh, a H4N um, recorder as well, a Zoom H4N, which is uh, great, especially if you want to go out and do like man on the street interviews because the sound quality is so good. But before that, I mean, blog talk radio was okay, but everybody would say, 
you know, the sound quality is not good enough. I'm like, well, it's good. It's good enough. It's not great. And then once I got my new setup, I was like, okay, I can, you know, once you go to that quality of sound, it's like you can't go back, for me at least. I mean, I can listen to shows on Blog Talk Radio, but they sound, the sound is garbage. It's like they're on the phone. And a lot of times they actually literally are on the phone doing the show, like the host is on the phone. But anyway, um, we're happy to hear from you via phone, speaking of phones, and you can reach us at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664 or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And you can check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which links to our Facebook, all our social media, our contact information. If you forget the phone number or the username for Skype, or if you want to read our article slash blogs, there's a bunch of those there among other things. So that's Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com and as we do every other wednesday we have ken shorgen of the daily economist.com and of ken shorgen on youtube the link is actually in the event and it will be also in every uh our, everywhere the archive gets posted the description with the exact Um, Not that you need it. You can always search for it. But the exact link to the page is there. So thanks, Ken, as always, for joining us. Uh, No problem. And I guess I'm everywhere now. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Just kidding. At least... At least when... um, Well, I know you're you're expanding your whole... uh, Operation there and with your your podcast and, uh, you know... Uh, different uh, social media uh, applications and places and whatever, and which you should try to get as many places as you want. But at least when you're on this show, it posts to all those places, just so you know. And it posts a description, too. So it posts your uh, website and it posts that you're on YouTube. So hopefully, you know, it, it helps. I mean, I don't know um, how... I could measure that, but hopefully, you know, it, it, it helps and it, it, uh, gets, you know, you, I mean, you're bigger than me already anyway, but hopefully those people that listen to my show that might not know who you are, hopefully, you know, it, it helps you. And I know you're on other shows too, that are bigger than mine, like Angel Clark show and stuff like that. But, but, um, I think the key thing is, is, uh, over time, the connections that I've gotten, you know, I didn't start out knowing anybody. I just, when I first started, I was writing articles for Examiner, uh, just happened to hit upon a few that went viral uh, with some news that mostly even in the alternative uh, financial media didn't pick up on. So I started getting some requests, you know, and my articles picked up on some really good uh, news sites. And Eventually, uh, I started getting radio invites, and then I picked up some connections working with uh, V, the Gorilla Economist, over at Rogue Money, and that you know that's really starting to, starting to bloom. As a matter of fact, he just uh, picked up for the um, the consortium of contributors uh, somebody called Syria Syrian Girl, and she's I, a, I've heard of her before, I believe. Yeah, she's in the outback in Australia, but she's from Syria. Has her family still in Syria, and she does podcasts, uh, really just telling the truth about what's going on it, with the uh, ISIS and yeah. Is and, that uh, the girl? There's two girls I'm thinking of. One was on actually both of them were on Fox um, before, but one of them was a girl that went to school and got like uh, injured for going to school in in Syria. And then, well, maybe that wasn't Syria. Maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. But um, the other one was just on, um, you know, like some big uh, media shows like yeah, Fox. Yeah, she's, and... she's, uh, she's been on Fox and a few others. Yeah, um, so that's I, I think in, I, that's how I know her. There in Skype, I linked uh, her YouTube channel. So if she looks familiar, that's, uh, that's what it is. But also, um, about two months ago, we picked up a new contributor. He's the son of a 
prince in the Saudi family. Now it's way, 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 way down on the tree. But he's a lot of princes in those families, right? (laughs) But when he got like six wives and everybody, yeah. But uh, you know, he's got ties to uh, the the royal family, so he pretty much knows everything that's going on in the Middle East. Period. So you know, these are the type of uh, connections that really help uh, you know make a name. Yeah, I mean, and again, I'm I'm probably smaller than all those people, but I had heard you. and I, I think it's been it's been a while now, and um, I was actually even surprised that that you agreed to come on, just because I at that time I was even smaller than I am now. But I had heard you on the Angel Clark show, and I thought you were really good, and not just in your information, because I wanted somebody to um, be able to have knowledge of the economy and history and and geopolitics. But in your presentation, I thought was great. You know, I thought I, I and I always told you before you did your uh, podcast that I'm like, you should do radio because you have a great presentation um, the way you present it. And I, I had already said, I, I think you sound like Seth Rogen, too. Which yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. But no, but I mean, you have a great delivery and, and just you're good in, on on radio. I always thought so. So that's why I was like you know, Hey, maybe the, maybe that guy would come on my show. So I, you know, just, uh, I think I friended you on Facebook and I friended you on Facebook before that, because I had heard you on her show and, and thought you were really good. And then, um, I had asked you cause I, I, you know, I thought, uh, that you would be a great a- a- addition and, um, something different to bring to the show that I don't have the expertise in. And I have to say as well that I've learned a lot just from having you on the show, as well as my conversations with you off the air as well. But, um, you know, since in general, just meeting you, having you on the show, talking to you on and off the air, that I've learned a lot about, you know, things that I've had really limited knowledge on. So it's been a good experience for me not just uh for the uh, you know the audience and being being able to bring that to them but also for me personally to be able to gain more knowledge in those areas um so it's it's great um all, all around so right so anyway um the first thing obviously you know I went through the last couple of uh, shows, and I actually uh, did a big outline today, bigger than what I usually do, because um, there was a lot of stuff that I uh, wanted to make sure that we we talk about, you know, if if we have the time to get to. But, of course, the biggest thing that happened today, um, we should probably start off with uh, the Fed finally from what I uh, understand uh, from your podcast that they uh, have finally made the second rate hike in a decade. And- yeah. The second rate hike in a decade and uh, exactly one year uh, after the last one. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, wasn't it last December? I know it was exactly. in December. And see, they, they do it for all the wrong reasons. Um, last December, they had promised since October of 2014 when they ended QE3, uh, we're going to prepare to raise rates. They went a year and two months. They went 14 months, and their credibility had been, you know, was virtually shot. So they just had to do credibility? it. Credibility? Yeah. <laughs> the Fed well, has credibility? When did this happen? <laughs> well, they got credibility with the computer algos that run the stock markets right, and right. all this. Buddy. So anyway, the uh, they finally did it. They did a quarter point, but it wasn't really a quarter point. It was more like a quarter point in the discount window. And that, uh, j- just to clarify, that was from zero. Well, right. It, no, it was like at point one five, point zero point one five. It wasn't okay. exactly zero, but it wasn't. It was. It was pretty either. close. <laughs> right. It was closer close to you, zero yeah. than it was to right. It was like a rounding error. Right. Above right, right. So, uh, yeah, they did that, but it really wasn't the interest rate that they raised. They raised the Fed discount window, which is the window where banks get to borrow money from the Fed. So, right. it, you know, they did. They made a big thing of it, and interestingly enough, 
uh, you know, last year, the stock markets went up for the first two weeks after the Fed hike. Gold went down to 1048. And then all of a sudden, the final week after Christmas, everything started to implode. And for the first 17 days of January, first 17 trading days of January, it was every single day was in the red. And then gold went from 1048 to 1350. Just, so, just for the audience, for people that, you know, can understand this a little better. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from how I understand it, you know, the Fed sets the rates. That's, as you said, the rate that they give to the banks. And right. then the banks, they set those rates at whatever, but they're going to set them lower the lower the rate is that they get from the Fed, obviously, right? Well, they're, because, no, they're going to set them higher so they can get it. Well, you, right, them. right. But what no, what I mean is is that they're going to set them lower based on how low the Fed rate is. So, like, if the Fed rate is zero, then the bank rate will, will be probably, like, 3% or something. You know what I mean? As right. opposed to if it was 5%, then the bank rate might be 10%. Is what you know, I mean. You want me to give you the chain chain of uh, interest rates? Sure. Okay. Primarily, there's the Fed. That's the central right. bank that that prints money. Exactly. Uh, they create money. Um, banks go borrow from the Fed at the Fed discount window rate. Right. Which, which we which we talked about was the zero one point two five. And now, what was yeah. the in was right, the right increase? Now, was it point five? Um, it was a quarter point. Um, and you know, it had been a little bit more than point one five. With no, this, I mean the um the one this time was it? It was a, it was a it, quarter it's point. another quarter point. Okay, it is now it is now at point six two five. Okay, so if you think about it, uh, if they raised a yeah they raised more than a quarter point. I think it was like point three seven five, but it was only the discount window. It wasn't the the regular interest rates. So they went so, from. So uh, would, when just to take a step back, um, so when you say that the discount window, that's where the banks borrow from, as you were saying, right? right? This, but, this is where the banks borrow from. But what's then, the other the other part of it? If yeah, they that, and that and that's what I'm going to get to. I'm going to okay. give you the chain chain of it. Cool. Banks borrow from the Fed discount window. Um, it was at point one two five last December. They raised it a quarter point to three uh, thirty seven five. They raised it a quarter point today. It's now at point six two five. So that's what they can borrow at. Then there is and, and that's is where b- before we get to that. Sorry. So that's where the banks will borrow. And like I had said right before that, then they they'll give out even though they're not really loaning money much. But th- is that what they base the money that they get? They're going to base their rates to the public on that. No, no, no. This is simply what the, 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 right, right. No, I understand that. But I'm saying that's what they're borrowing money at. That's so, what the banks are borrowing right, money. at. Right, right. right. So the bank but, will get that money. And is that the money that they loan out to people and they'll increase it by whatever, you know, like I was saying, maybe it will be 3% or 4% for a home loan or something. Yes, but, yes and no. Yes and no. I, there's still more in the chain. Okay. But let me go, Sorry, let me go, go ahead, ahead and reach it through. Okay. So that's what the banks borrow from the Fed, the central bank. Then there is what is known as LIBOR. LIBOR is a higher rate than the, the yeah, Fed I, discount window. We've talked and this about is that what before, banks, I believe. Banks but... let, uh, the rate banks uh, charge each other to lend money. Now, most of the banks... Um, we're told by the Fed that you can't allow the, all this money that you borrow to trickle into the general economy or you're going to create massive inflation. So so, they, so just to uh, – again, sorry, just to, to take take a step back to, um, so everybody understands. So you're talking about banks – so not the Fed, but you're talking about individual banks like Bank of America and Wells Fargo lending each other money? Correct. Okay. Or – Bank of America cha- trading with or lending to Deutsche Bank across the thing. You can do this. Well, also I mean any bank. I'm just, I'm just right. using that as an example. Right. Um, exactly. But so so they set the rates on that as well. But they set those rates high I, higher. I would That's believe. Okay. So say say it's point six two five for them to borrow from the Fed, and then it's about one point five for them to lend to each other. Okay. okay. 
So what, what, is, what is it? Is that what it is now? Oh, it or? changes. The LIBOR rate changes. Remember the, the 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 big scandal about the manipulation of the LIBOR rate? Yeah, yeah. The LIBOR rate fluctuates. It does it fluctuates uh, on a daily Up basis. Or down, or? Yeah, depending. And see that rate. See if you is that to, depend, depending on activity, like what's going on as far as banks lending with each other, or to, before answering all your questions, let me go ahead and finish this chain. Okay, sorry, and then ahead. you can go back to to you know asking about specific things. There's a LIBOR rate. The LIBOR rate fluctuates. It's the it's the rate that banks lend amongst each other when they need extra liquidity, money, etc. From the LIBOR rate, okay, that's the baseline that will then be used for car loans, home mortgages, student loans, etc. They'll tack on more to the LIBOR rate. So if you think about it, if they manipulate the LIBOR rate, that will have an effect on trillions of they'll, loans. They'll make more money. And credit cards and all that. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're siphoning off by manipulating the LIBOR rate. This is why if you, uh, if you go in for a home mortgage, they tell you to lock in the rate. Yeah. OK, because the home mortgage rate does fluctuate. So OK, you know, it doesn't wait until the Fed comes back and changes right, the, right. the rate. No, it will fluctuate whatever. But here's the here's the kicker. There's also an outside influence that affects um, the interest on different things. And it's called the bond market. And here's where the Fed you know, in 2015, they raised the rates because they were losing credibility, not because they actually wanted to. Today, they raise the rates because the, the invisible hand of the market has already gotten out of control. OK, the 10 the year bond in the last ever since uh, the Trump election, November 8th. So we're talking, what, one month and one week ever since November 8th, the 10 year bond has gone from one point seven to two point six. That's how much that's 90 basis points. The Fed only raised the discount window today, the interest rate, by 25 basis points. But the market itself has raised at 90. So the market is getting away from the Fed. The Fed's playing reaction now. So they're at least trying to catch up somewhat with the market. But the problem right? is is that when the, when the yields go up, that means people don't want to buy bonds. If, if you remember when I talked about bonds, right, when right. it's a higher yield, that means, say, uh, you pay – say it's a 2 point – 2.6 did i say 2. Point, yeah 2.6 yeah. percent yield that means you're going to pay 97.4 percent of the actual bond and then over the course of 10 years you'll get that much interest well when the yields go up then obviously you want you want to buy when bonds, the yields right? go up that means that the, that nobody's buying the bonds because it, if you're lending money and you have no demand you're going to do cheaper interest rates because you want people to borrow money. If there's too much demand, then you're going to charge higher interest rates because you want less people to, to borrow money Right. because you're losing your supply. Uh, same thing with uh, a business. If, uh, right, right. All of a sudden, if it's Christmas time and people are buying Cabbage Patch Kids, then the price is going to shoot through the roof. Yeah, I mean, supply it's, a, it's well. supply and demand theory, right. basically. And it's the same way in the bond market. So the bond market has gotten away from the, uh, from the Fed. And when the bond market starts to get away from the Fed, guess what? It takes years before the Fed can catch up. The, the thing is already hot. Now, why did the bond market shoot up? Well, the bond market shot up because nobody wants to buy bonds. That means is that it, everybody, foreigners, are dumping them. Is it based off all the same, you know, like algorithms and all that shit? That, that, no, uh, no that, that's the equity market. So how do they set the uh, bond rate? How is uh, they've, got, they've got they've got uh, charts and 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 you know measurements and things like that. They have a percentage of demand versus supply. Uh, you could say it's an algorithm, but it's not but like it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Computers don't it's, buy bonds. It's more it's, of a computerized uh, setup, but it's not like the stock right. market that automatically just reacts to things and whatever. And they have like a probably set programming or something that will exactly. set their rate. Here, here, Here's the demand. Here's the supply, and depending on how much is right, whatever, right. Um, and and each each week, the central banks all across the world have what are called bond auctions, and they'll sell bonds that are like six months, one year, two year, five year, ten year, all the way up to thirty year, or, except if you're in like uh, where is it, 
Sweden, or Netherlands, they now have a 100-year bond. That's uh, something like to pass on because you're probably going to be dead. Well, uh, here's something interesting. The reason this is important is because one of the things Donald Trump has suggested is that to fund, to borrow the money to fund the infrastructure projects that he wants to do to re-stimulate the economy, uh, almost everything that the U.S. borrows is short-term bonds. Um, Two-year, five-year, n- nothing higher than that. And that's why we have to keep rolling it over and we have to keep printing more money to roll it over. That's another reason why the debt goes. Because uh, you know, with $20 trillion of debt, that's at, at five-year bonds, that means every four years, or no, you're doing $4 trillion of having to uh, buy new bonds and pay off the maturing bonds or roll them over every single year over every five years. So that's where it's getting that. So he wants to do a 100-year bond, which, of course, with a fiat currency, the money 100 years from now is only going to be worth about 5% five per- 5% or less of what it is now. So. You know, yeah, it's, it's gonna. It, you gonna? Wouldn't you have to have a much higher yield on that because of inflation and all of that shit? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Plus the fact that anybody who buys the bonds could be dead. Right. That's except, what I was. Gonna, that's what I was saying. The fact but I mean, if you, you want to buy it for like, you know, your grandchildren or something, I don't know. Hundred-year bonds are pretty much the central bank buys. Yeah, because so who would really – you think and, about and it, even way, that the Fed, it would the be Fed, – The Fed is an interesting uh, bird, okay, because the Fed will print money and buy all this, all these assets and whatever. But according to the charter and by law, any profits that the Fed makes goes back to the Treasury. Yeah, I, I know I, because I did research uh, a couple years ago. Because I, I I wanted to learn about the Fed based on what they say, so I'm going through everything, and you know they have financial statements, they have quote unquote auditors, so they you know I I don't really consider them they're auditors, but I don't believe half the shit that they say, but yeah they end up with income on their income statement, and it goes back to the treasury, but it's it's not that much and that's what they supposedly you know i don't know how much that number is uh messed with you know when it comes to what uh their system of accounting although they're supposed to be using you know gap but but uh that doesn't mean that they're not Here, doing the shady thing. shit Here, here's here's the thing okay yes the fed is a private institution yeah it can pretty much do anything that it wants. It can trade equities. It can, you know, pretty much do what it wants. However, the benefit, you know, the banks that are the shareholders, they don't get uh, any of the profits from the Fed. That goes to the Treasury. What the banks do, though, is get the ability to borrow money at virtually zero. And the Fed is the yeah. lender of last resort. So if they're going to be insolvent and go out, boom, they can just go and borrow money. So that's the key things about the the banks. The banks can borrow money at cheap. Lend it out to to you and I for uh, four to, or if it's credit card, twenty one percent. They get tons of money, so they're yeah, not really was, worrying about the yeah. fact that the uh, the other profits go to the treasury, right? But someone was trying to justify the Fed because they say, well, the money goes back to them, but the money that goes back to them is after like all of this money is paid out and salaries, and it's just it's not a lot of money that ends up going back. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. like they get all of the interest back from the Fed each year that they would end up paying. It's not even oh, exactly. close. It, it, it's not like it's not like the Fed is a big revenue stream for the government it, at exa- all. No. Exactly. So that that's what I was saying with that. Right. So, um, is it okay to take a step back here now? Yeah. To yeah. The, okay. So. Just so so people understand that you know get house loans for houses or cars or whatever, so they do the banks get give those loans with uh, money that they're getting from other banks because as we said earlier, they make more money off of those, especially if they manipulate them. Um, because they can say they're higher than they are, but 
Oh, sure. Is that yes. what they use to um, – because they base it off whatever the rate is. So, let, like, and that that was my point. They, that, determine, that, they, they determine LIBOR, HJ. The LIBOR rate is like like the gold fix, okay? Once or twice a day, the banks will get together. And there's a there's a little group in a, in a closet, you know, for for the better, you know, visual thing. There's a group of, like, uh, 10 bankers from 10 different major banks in a closet, and they determine the LIBOR rate each day. And the manipulation comes from... The fact that they're about to announce the LIBOR fix rate at, say, the afternoon, and uh, say the, they announce it, and then somebody wants at one bank wants to borrow money, they may say, "Hey, uh, why don't you why don't you back backtrack and say you you uh, lent me the money an hour before the fix, right. so I get give the lower, them a lower rate." rate. And, then, yeah. Yeah. And, and we're talking, but we're talking probably you know hundreds of a percent. Right. Right. But when you're dealing with trillions of transactions, like how many people have credit cards, how many people have student loans, auto loans, mortgages, when it's you're dealing with money that, to the, it, to the yeah, bank. Yeah, exactly. So hundreds of percent of interest rates can mean, you know, take a look at this. It might not mean much to an individual person, but it, it will mean a lot to the bank. We'll, we'll give an example. Um, the With the 10-year rate going up since November 8th to uh, – 2.6 today it was it was hung, hanging between 2.4 and 2.5 until the fed raised rates today but at 2.4 it had caused if anybody was looking at mortgage rates mortgage rates are now over four and they're they're about four to 4.1 okay is, is there that, is, is, that means that seven hundred thousand people who were thinking about refinancing or borrowing buying a home change their that mind move, but they can't do it. But they, but they so can do it. Seven hundred thousand people. But on that, so is there uh, a law or a formula of how much they can up it? So, say the LIBOR rate. I don't know. Let's say it's two percent or something, just for the hell of it. So, is there an amount, a limit, or a cap on how much they can increase it? on a loan for say a home loan or a, and I know there's going to be higher rates depending on your credit and stuff like that, but is there um, certain rates that they have to keep it within or are they allowed to do, you know, I'm sure They're there's reg regulation. Whatever they they, want. So they can put the rates at whatever they want. Exactly. And see, if you think about it, um, well, that's, you know, uh, Congress, I mean, Congress and Ron that Paul. Way, I guess. Congress and Ron Paul have been screaming at Bernanke. If you if you ever watched any of those uh, times when the Fed had to go before the House and the Senate, which uh, Yellen's going to do here in a, about a week, um, they do that every quarter. Uh, he, he was, you know, that's where they they will challenge the Fed on why they do something. But um, they gave Fed carte blanche. The Fed is in charge of monetary policy, not fiscal policy monetary policy now the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy is interest rates and the amount of money in circulation is the fed's purview the things like regulations like uh stimulus like uh government spending that's, that's all the fiscal government, policy yeah, yeah. and that's government yeah that's their that's congress so on the window uh, that you talked about who did they who do they lend that money to, if anybody? Is that what goes to the billionaire elite? Anybody who's, anybody who's a commercial bank. So it only goes to banks? Correct. Okay, yeah, the, the so Fed, that's the what Fed they deals use. With banks. They don't deal with anything else except that they do buy bonds, okay, for, you know, the government wants and, to and create. stocks too, right? If, if the government wants, wants money, okay, to increase the national debt or whatever, they will print up a bunch of bonds and they'll take them to the Fed and they'll say, hey, sell these and uh, out there on the market and trade it for, you know, create create the amount of money that these bonds are doing. And the, the Fed has 11 what are called primary dealers. These are bullion banks that uh, have a desk where they sell bonds in the auction. So the Fed just doesn't, you know, you can't go over to Eichel's, you know, Eccles Street or Eccles Building on uh across from J.P. Morgan's headquarters, the New York Fed, and uh, once a week stand out there on the doorstep and, and bid on bonds. No, they, they give these bonds to the banks like J.P. Morgan, 
uh, right. Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whatever, and they have desks, just like they have trading desks for, for stocks, they have desks that they go out and they do an auction and people will bid and even foreign entities will bid and they'll buy that and that's where they get the money and the money goes to the government and guess what, you just increase the deficit in the national debt. That's how they do it. So, but but they still also give basically cash loans to the banks as well, right? Or are you just saying oh, yeah. it's all done to yeah. yeah. so, so basically but, but that, it, gets even more. it gets even more. It gets even more. Okay. Because but, they knew they were going to increase uh, stimulus and QE over the last uh, eight years. They knew that if tens of trillions of dollars got into the general economy, like say loaning to small businesses or loaning to whatever. Right, it would have caused that, a bunch of inflation. Right. So what the Fed did was when they kept the, the borrowing rate at the discount window at 0.125, just above zero, they were saying, okay, banks, if you keep your money in the Fed, just like we'll we pay would you interest. Savings Didn't, account, weren't they pay an interest on it? They were paying a quarter point interest yeah. rate. So the banks were then borrowing money at 0.125, getting 0.25 in return. They were doubling their money just for right, holding it. Right, right. I remember when and we were talking about that. If you remember, we are in what is called a fractional reserve system. Yes, I know all about they, it. <laughs> yeah, they, so they borrow $100 million and then they can create another uh, you know, $10 billion from that, and that's what they and use. And then it repeats, play, too, because the- if, if they deposit that money back into that bank, then, I mean, and they're going to deposit it into some bank, so no matter what, another bank is able to create a bunch of money off it. And then another bank is be able to create a bunch of money off it, and it, unless it's going towards you know a specific purchase or something like that. Yeah, but, but if it's but getting also, deposited into a bank, you're able to recreate. Um, you're able to create more, even more money. Right, but that's just what the the banks borrow to hold their liquidity, to hold their capital reserves. When you and I go to get a loan from a bank, the bank no longer. Uh, takes the money from depositors and uses that as the as the capital for the loan. Right. They only need ten percent. They need no. To they don't even do that. Ten percent. Right. When 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 they fill out the loan application and approve of you, they send a letter to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve prints the entire amount of money out of thin air. It's now electronic. Everything's electronic. And it, when when we talk about gold and uh, the amount of money in circulation, I'll show you the difference between between that. So anytime you do a, uh, you know, and see, this is the thing, okay? This is the whole thing behind this system. The reason why they continuously need consumers to spend is because they they continuously need new debt created to cover the right, debt that right. they have. Right, right, because money is created by debt. But I thought that they need to keep 10% on hand with the Federal Reserve. So basically, oh, 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 if yeah, they have yeah. 100000 you know, uh, they can uh, lend out, you know, a million or whatever. Yeah, they, they, that, that is exactly true. Yeah, so no, that's but, what but I was saying. What? But those reserve requirements changed in 2008. Did they, did they lower them? or They lowered them immensely. Yeah, I think you mentioned that. So, But what, what I was saying was that it doesn't only happen once because once you loan that money out, if if the person you're loaning it to is depositing it into their bank account, right, then you get to do it again. And then if it gets deposited again into another bank account, it gets to get done again. So that one loan where you created, uh, you know, all this money, you get to create more money and more money and more money right. if, if it goes into the bank. Right. So and see, this it's, is, it's not this just is, a one time. It's, you know, you have the Fed that creates the money. Then you have the bank that creates the money from the fractional reserve banking. But that fractional reserve banking can go on like f- up to nine. Well, it can go on forever, really. But usually somebody's going to use it for a purchase or something. But somebody's probably going to end up putting it in a bank somewhere and then they're going to be able to use it and do the same thing again. No, no, they don't put it in that bank. They put it in the Fed. Well, I'm talking about they, the person if, that, that if, loans. If, hold on a second. If, if I go to Bank of America and right. I get a, a home mortgage for $245,000, they'll send a letter to the Fed and they'll say, okay, um, 
we need to create two hundred forty-five thousand dollars out of thin air. Boom! The, it's digital things. It comes in. It tells the bank you have two hundred forty-five thousand dollars on credit, and they have to have created. whatever in reserve, right? Whatever the well, no, 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 the no, 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 no. Hold on. Lending like this, like I said, it's no longer about what is in the reserves from savings account and checking account. Those are, that's meaningless now. Since they came, went to electronic banking, okay, everything's ones and zeros. They don't right. have – they just have a, a ledger item, but they don't have the actual money. It's zeros and ones. The, the actual uh, recognition of the money when it's created from the Fed out of thin air – is it stored at the Fed, and they get interest on it? Okay, and they have on their ledger right. sheet. Then they can increase it. They, you know, they can boom, 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 boom. Now, here's where the here's where the the whole thing gets into a kicker. But they still have to have money at the Fed. Well, whatever, electronically on the Fed's books. Yeah, exactly, it's on. They the have book. to have wh- whatever you want to. G- you you got to get this. Uh, we got to get this out of our head, people. It's not real money. It's right, the right. It's zeros. On a ledger, right, I I, I I know I understand that, but it's still they, you know, it was ten percent, but whatever the percentage is, they lend out, you know, the difference. They can lend up to, you know, if it was five percent, then they can lend out ninety five percent or whatever they have. Bingo. Um, but so what were but, you saying about the ability to so so they say they write a check to that person, for example. Right. And that person deposits the money into another bank. Right. Now, Here, that the, bank, the can't they here's, do the same thing and then no, lend out no, money? Because, because because you miss you miss the whole thing. When somebody goes to buy a house. OK, there's already somebody who owes money on that house. Well, no, you're taking the, 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 the example money, of the buying money. a house. I'm talking right. about people that, you know, are. You know, depending on what they're using it for, um, if they're using it for, say, a business and they're not spending it right away, they're going to spend it at some point. Um, but business loans are much different than co- consumer right, loans. Right, right. So I see what you're saying. That most, the most like of the business. Right, right. On, they, see, see, if, if, if I go to buy a house, OK, at Bank of America. And uh, they approve of me, and they print two hundred forty-five thousand dollars out of thin air. I never see the check. What they do is, of course, we have your realtor who right, goes through for the, that for when you're buying thing, a house. The money goes to pay off the bank who's got the original loan, and guess what? That money then disappears because this is something it, they don't they don't keep it. What, okay, here's the thing about about electronic banking and fractional reserve banking, and why they have to continuously create debt. Because there's a thing known as monetary inflation and monetary deflation. That's different than price inflation and price deflation. Monetary inflation is when you expand the money supply. Monetary deflation is when you uh, decrease, decrease the monetary the, yeah. supply. When you um, pay off a loan, you are suddenly decreasing the monetary supply because once you pay off that loan – that's no longer on the books as a loan, and the money disappears. The zeros and ones are gone. But it also and gets increased. It, it gets increased by interest as well, because interest is is because money is debt. The interest is money that doesn't exist. Correct, correct. So once you pay, they don't want people to pay off their loans. They want people to be no, eternal, they, be, they want, or whatever. Right, because right. as long as the loan is outstanding, then that money that they got stays on the books. Once the loan is paid off, right. boom, it's erased from their books and they, they can't claim and that. And they lower money. the amount of money that's out there. And when they lower the money amount of money that's out there, guess what? It Say say they leveraged uh, a $10,000 car loan to $100,000. Once you pay off that $10,000, guess what? Not 10000 disappears from their balance sheet, 100000 because that leverage, that fractional reserve – no longer has the original collateral. Okay, he, he, here I'm trying. I'm trying to think of an example where the money would go to you. So, say I I somehow got a loan of thirty thousand dollars to do home improvements, and I'm going to do them when I want. So they give me a check, right? Right. So I deposit that check. So now right. what I'm saying is now they can take that money and reloan that money out and create even more money off the money that they just created. 
Sure, but here's so here's that the, that was my point. But right, I, but here's here's the reality of but it. But most and, of it goes to other things. You're right. right. You know, if the, it's a home loan the or of what you, the personal loans that are not backed by any any that's collateral. That's what I was like more that, talking about. These were things that were done in the 80s and and 70s and 80s. Yeah, and 90s. they're not really doing it anymore. They don't do that anymore. So it's sort of it, it. And when they do do it, it's a trickle in the bucket. And see, that's been replaced. Personal loans have been replaced by. Home equity loans. When they created the the bubble, people didn't go borrow without collateral. Right. They borrowed on the on the equity on the difference that they're between rising. what. They're, yeah. And, and, and just, yeah, just to clarify for people, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the difference between what you've paid off in your house and what your house is worth. Yeah, and, it's and, the that's what equity is. It's the difference between you know if you're if you owe you know, a hundred thousand on your house and your house is worth 400,000 and you have 300,000 in equity. Um, right. that you and they're more than happy to borrow it because you know why they want you to, they need of you course. to create more debt. To they get can the system. create more money. But right away, what happens is in theory, there's not enough money in the world to pay off the interest that was just created in theory, because money is debt, right? Correct. So that never got created. The interest. Right. So somehow, so it, it's it's a fucked up system. It's just, it, if fractional reserve banking in itself is just ridiculous and all of the, a lot of this shit. But um, here's, here's, here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing. It's not just the bankers. We can't just blame the bankers. Oh, no. I'm not just blaming the bankers. I'm saying no. fractional reserve banking as what? itself is a fucked up thing. Um, right, but here's, here's, the, here's the whole point, okay? People don't have to use debt. They have a choice. No, you can but buy you everything in cash. It's much, but it's but people. Well, that's are what people lazy. used people to are do. People are lazy animals. That and that's if you give the them difference. Welfare, they'll, they'll take that versus working. And if you can give them free money at low interest rates, they will take well, that. that that's, all their material goods yeah. that they want to do. It's it's human nature. Well, it's good. It's supposedly it it's good to have a. Nature certain amount of debt to leverage but that's more with businesses Obviously, than i would yeah, say personally and businesses but here's the thing they will tell you oh you got to have a great credit score you know debt or credit is really good no that's been a lie from day one credit is and debt is bondage Okay. Yeah, debt is you having debt that, is bad. You it's pay, you know have the gold. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. That's what people did. You know, 60 years ago is more people they would not buy something unless they actually saved up the money to buy it. As opposed and, and to a, now, you have a total. I gotta have this now mentality. Um, going on and everybody buys shit on credit and everybody's in debt and and here's you you hit the nail on the head the reason that things have increased in price so much is because we've expanded the money supply by giving out all this cheap credit education and credit the same education. thing credit's money that's just created by nothing correct it's money here's, here's, created out of nowhere bingo and if you you know if i went to uh, say what's a good university? Northwest Northwestern University. Okay, it's not the greatest, uh, but it's really pretty good. It's 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 one of the better ones. It's good. The, it's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to say Yale and Harvard because they have a different system. They have said they have such a uh, big stock of uh, of cash in their trust trustee you know trust fund that about half their people get free scholarships anyway. So I don't want to use that as a as a baseline. But say Northwestern. I went, if I went to Northwestern in the early, uh, the late seventies, early nineteen eighties, I would have paid about uh, forty to sixty dollars per credit hour. Today, I'm going to pay four thousand dollars per well, credit. Well, well, never mind. Even going, you don't have, you don't even have to go back that loans, far because the student loan uh, system that came out of the seventies, okay, made cheap money so readily that it the increase in the money that was going to the education system allowed them to raise the prices for the same yeah, bloody you education don't, you that you what? would have gotten for $40. You don't, don't even have to hour. go back that far. In the past, like, 20 years, pr prices have skyrocketed. Like, UNLV used to be, like, $1,500 for in-state tuition, 
And I think now it's like four or five. And, and, and that's a small increase. You know, right. it's still but, cheap. But, used- but what, what I'm saying is, is that even the school I went to, I went to a private school was 20 grand. I think now it's like 40 grand. So uh, I, I know what you're saying, that that's what changed it. But even it, you're looking at um, since then, you know, even if you go from like the 90s to now, the late nineties or early two thousands. I mean, it's ridiculous. Now I, I read an article about a lot of these schools because they know that they're going to get their money. No matter what are spending money on ridiculous shit. And they're increasing their tuition prices based on that. Um, so that, that's another thing, but it, there's, that's, an, there's an article I wrote, I wrote, and I don't know if you want to bring it up, but I think it's a great uh, parallel sure, to what we're ahead, talking about. Go ahead. 30 years ago was, uh, well, 29 to, you know, 29 years ago was uh, the 1987 stock market crash. Right. Okay. I, I did a study and you can go out yeah, to I the was gonna, I was going to bring this up anyway. I have it on my list. The, 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 what are you, so you're talking about the, what you talked about on one of your shows, right? Yeah. Yeah, the Dow, I have it on my list anyway. The, so the go ahead. The debt to Dow ratio, okay, is the same today as it was in 1987. And let me right. let me explain and break this down for people, okay? In 1987, try to break it down and as, as simple as possible for for people, yeah, like that's in what I'm layman good. terms, I guess. I mean, I listened to it. I believe I understood it, but okay. In 1987, right at the peak. Uh, Black Monday, the the stock market crash. The amount, the the Dow Jones indicator, which is the top thirty con- companies, they're like from Averaged, the, right? the, yeah, they're the primary yeah. industries of uh, on the on the New York Stock Exchange. That's what the Dow is. The uh, Dow average was twenty two forty six. Okay, that was what the stock market was twenty two forty six. At the time of the uh, of the stock market crash, the national debt was two point three five trillion. Twenty two forty six to three two point three five trillion. That's a ratio of one to nine fifty four. So it's relatively close to one to one. Okay, ninety five percent of the of the thing. Over the the nineties, you had uh, what you found is is that as the uh, national debt went up, so too did the stock market go in virtually the same ratio or it went in multiples depending on when they did extra things? Um, of course, we know that in the 90s, you had the dot-com bubble. Okay. But here's here's something else that most people don't take in consideration. I know you mentioned with um... – I don't know if this is getting too far ahead, but with uh, in during the Clinton years that they they never really balanced the budget because they raided Social Security. But correct um, uh, the the okay when Bill Clinton took office, the national debt at uh, the end of 1992 was 4.064 trillion dollars. When Bill Clinton left in uh, 2000, the national debt was about 5.6 trillion dollars. So people would say, well, you know what? In eight years, he only went up $1.6 trillion. No. What he did to, quote, unquote, balance the budget was he took the 3 to $4 trillion of act- that was actual cash in the Social Security Fund. He replaced it with treasuries, i.e. debt, and then took that money and used it in his budget. So if you take the fact that that was debt that has to be repaid by the government, right. $4 trillion – in essence, what Bill Clinton did is he doubled the national debt from 4.064 when he took because office. Because it's money that's still owed out. It's still it's a still owed out. So $4 trillion plus the $1.6 trillion in national debt, he raised it by $5.6 trillion. Well, the uh, dot-com bubble or dot-com boom, of course, took uh, took the stock market up to 11000 the Dow, in, uh, in 2000 just before the collapse of the dot-com bubble. That's a multiple of two from the from how much national debt. But the reason that it's a multiple versus a straight line thing is because um, what uh, uh, Greenspan did, the Fed Fed chairman, is he lowered interest rates from seven point two five percent, which was at the the time of the eighty seven crash. He lowered it down to three point two five, 
when Clinton took office. So you then lessen the cost of borrowing money by half, and you increase the national debt by two. Thus, you have a and it ended up being a three, almost a threefold increase. Thirty three oh one was the Dow when Clinton took uh, Clinton took over, and eleven thousand was it was when it was done. So that's a, th a multiple of three. But the reason it's that multiple at the time was because there were two special things done. The debt was increased immensely, and then the interest rates were brought down. Now, right. um, following through over the 30 years, okay, there are rises and falls on when this ratio was near one-to-one. -one. It always will be because during a recession, you're going to have a pullback. Uh, and then you had, of course, a stimulus after 2008. But here we are back to square one. On December 9th, the Dow closed at 19,756. December 9th, which was what? Five Friday. days ago? Friday. The national debt on Friday was 19,877,000. 19,756, 19,877. The ratio is 1 to 9.994, virtually 1 to 1. So in the course of 30 years, the debt and the stock market, the Dow, have stayed pretty much equivalent. That tells you how much um, asset prices have been propped up all because of the increase in debt. So guess what happens? What happens to these assets if you stop creating new debt? Boom. They collapse like a burning house. And the stock market collapses. Mm-hmm. This is why they continuously need to create new debt because as things are paid off, that debt is gone from the system, but they have to create more and new. So, they have to do it more and more and more and more and more. To simplify it, what you're saying is that the debt is going to the stock market and the rise in the debt, not all of it, obviously, but the rise in the debt partially is because the rise in the stock market so it no, kind of evens no, out the stock market the stock market as an asset that's what it is an equity right, as right. an asset that has been a beneficiary of the increase in debt same thing with your right, house but, but the you debt went house. to same thing with uh um you know things like gold and silver up to a point but those are manipulated but we saw this you know during the when oil was at 145 we saw this when corn and soybeans were through the roof because in they're pro 11, well because what i'm saying is from what i understand all the money that the fed was printing was going to the stock market create uh, and creating debt at yes. the same time yes. right remember when, so, remember when i said the banks borrowed money from the from the fed they needed to do something with them, but they couldn't put it in right. the general so economy. so it went into the stock market. So it went into the stock market. It went into derivatives. It went into um, things like buying. But it also houses. became so, debt as well, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying, that the increase in debt has inflated has in, bubbles in right. everything. That's where the bubbles come from. Remember, you remember the the housing bubble led to the 80 to, to the 2008 crash. That money came because Greenspan took the and here's the thing. Greenspan took uh under George Bush, he started lowering interest rates again after the uh, after 9/11 and the recession of uh, 2001 to 2003. He lowered interest rates down to 1%. This led to the housing bubble. Well, it wasn't then, just that. It was they were giving loans to people that they knew couldn't pay them back and right. that whole but thing. Here's, and, here's the yeah. other. Here, well, they, they had so much money and they needed to create debt. They didn't care. See, there was a mindset. You know, they said housing. Bernanke said this multiple times. Housing prices have never historically fell. They may go stagnant, but they'll never fall. Well, guess what happened in just before Bernanke took office, Greenspan in 2005 started raising interest rates. When you raise interest rates, you, you increase the cost of borrowing money. Well, they were so – all the banks and, and the people, consumers were so leveraged from debt, they couldn't afford to buy, borrow money at this higher interest rate. What does that do? It's It pretty much is a deflation, and it causes the – assets to suddenly nobody's buying these things and that's when you saw them start to crash and and boom
Okay, this is why they. This is why Bernanke put interest rates at zero when he was in office. Yellen has kept them there. She has been hesitant to raise rates. The only reason she raised rates in 2015, as I said, was credibility. The only reason she did it today was because the markets themselves have are showing inflation, and they raise themselves. The bonds raise themselves. So, you know, she had no choice. It didn't matter whether she raised them or not. The cost of borrowing is increasing. <laughs> right. Well, what I want to do now is take a quick break and a lot of other stuff to talk about. That was just one uh, <laughs> one small item, but I wanted to get into it in detail. Um, there's still uh, a lot going on with cashless societies and some really fucked up things going on in India um, as and well Venezuela. as Venezuela. Yeah, and, and the EU as well. There's things going on with gold and a whole bunch of stuff uh, to talk about. So we'll play this clip and be right back after this with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist and Ken Shorjan on YouTube. Um, so we'll be right back. Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com. The end of cash is near. We've covered this before here at PFT, and in a nutshell, it's basically a problem reaction solution analysis. They nationalized the monetary system, which is a huge problem. We reacted by demanding more statism, which perpetuated the problem and now has created the proposed solution, which is a cashless society. But how are they going to justify banning cash? I mean, perhaps the next crash in the business cycle is going to be blamed on hoarding stockpiles of cash. We know the big banks and corporations are sitting on cash reserves. And the social justice, environmentalist, eugenics, leftist crowd are likely going to welcome a confiscation of this wealth. In fact, the move to a cashless society is really just one large step towards actual communism. Now, the central banks should not be setting interest rates at ridiculously low levels. It discourages savings and it encourages debt creation. And as we can see in Canada, or the US, or Japan, or Europe, this method of economic growth is really just asset inflation, which leads to recessions and ultimately depression. So their solution is lower interest rates until they're at zero. And then it's negative interest rates. We basically already have that here in Canada. I mean, just ask yourself if your bank or your credit union charges you more each month than you receive an interest. Now, historically, when governments mess around with the economy like this, people respond by hoarding their money. Now, if that money is paper, governments then respond by creating massive inflation and thereby forcing people to spend their money before it becomes completely worthless. Now, it doesn't necessarily quite work like that in our system today, so central banks are now responding by literally eliminating cash. The government wants all cash in the banks, so every transaction can be monitored, regulated, and completely controlled. Imagine the entire world recorded in one giant online ledger, controlled and monitored by a hierarchy of technocrats and self-serving bankers. Illuminating cash may happen after one of the next financial crises. I mean, bailouts have proven to be unpopular, so now there's even talks of bail-ins. We've covered this here before on PFT with Cyprus and the Canadian Connection. You see, a bail-in means that when a bank fails, it will reach into its depositors' accounts before accepting any money from taxpayers. And to keep fiat money in the banking system where the state can get to it, some economists have advocating banning cash. And some countries have already done so. 
Italy made cash transactions over 1,000 illegal. Switzerland is proposing banning cash payments in excess of 100,000. Russia banned cash transactions over 10,000. Spain banned cash transactions over 2,500. And Mexico made cash payments of more than 200,000 pesos illegal. Uruguay banned cash transactions over 5,000. And France made cash transactions over 1,000 illegal, down from the previous limit of 3,000. Denmark has also made moves towards a cashless society. They're not part of the euro, and they have their own currency called the krone. And the Danish government is proposing to scrap cash as a cost-saving measure. Even a member of German Council's economic experts is calling for a cashless society. He said it would be a good subject for the agenda of the G7 summit. And as for Canada, we're already well on to that road. An RBS report from 2011 found that the world average for paying by plastic amounted to 40% of transactions. But the rate in Canada was 68%, making us the world leader in people who are voluntarily going cashless. We also don't have a penny anymore, so the precedent has been set to get rid of nickels and quarters. (laughs) And, I mean, how far is this cost-saving measure argument going to reach? I mean, perhaps we better just get rid of all coins and all paper money to stop the drug dealers and the terrorists. The Royal Canadian Mint has actually looked into digital currencies, and although they later abandoned the project when it became clear that the state is not going to be able to duplicate Bitcoin. In fact, the whole point of the Bitcoin scheme is that it is independent from state involvement. Canada's Interact system is the world leader in digital fiat transaction systems. You can pay by debit card at a cash register or pay user fees at a bank machine. In the U.S., these kinds of transaction systems would be owned by the banks, and they usually charge fees on customers or impose costs on retailers. But the not-for-profit Canadian Interact costs so little that it overtook cash as the Canadian standard. A PayPal survey found that 71% of Canadians are ready to go cashless. And an RBC Shoppers Drug Mart poll found that 76% of Canadian women typically carry less than $50 on them compared to 66% of men. And as Wayne Bosert, uh, former executive vice president of RBC, says... We are increasingly becoming a cashless society. Canadians are recognizing that debit is a convenient way to pay, and now they can earn reward points on debit purchases that translate into savings. (laughs) Reward points on debit cards. As in, like, air miles and PC or shopper points, and all those other fake numbers that translate into cheaper groceries or movie theater tickets or whatever. You see, these fake reward points are not savings at all. They're just tokens in a phony economy where goods and services are provided by the corporate state apparatus. As the Canadian Bankers Association works on a unified, standardized system for smartphone payments in Canada, something that is likely going to evolve into a interact for smartphones, Analysts are all agreeing that within just a few years, our smartphones are going to be completely merged with our wallets. And I mean, greater advancements in technology are generally welcomed with open arms. Being able to pay for goods and services with your phone is a temptation that I don't think too many people are going to decline. You know, it's that classic problem-reaction-solution method that we've come to expect from the American elites. Their solution to the stock market crash in the early 2000s was to lower interest rates and thereby creating another problem. And the masses reacted to the bust in 2008 and 9, and the solution provided was more government intervention and even lower interest rates. 
And now the Fed is stuck at zero and quantitative easing just to keep everything afloat. But floating on what? I mean, the dollar's value is determined by a cartel of bankers and people's willingness to keep the casino going. The solution the elites provide in Canada and the U.S. is devaluing the currency, keeping interest rates low, and in effect wiping out the pensions and the retirement savings of the elderly, to name at least one group that's being affected. Everyone sees the effect of a nationalized monetary system when we go to the grocery store. Now, what will bring about this North American Union, according to the elites, is the breakdown of this system. Only then will there be any justification for locking our cash inside the electronic banking system. Goods and services will increasingly become rationed, not according to some free market pricing system, but the central planning grid of the authorities. And when money has become completely electronic, that is just nothing but numbers on your phone, well, the international banking system will have complete control of money. And they will be able to just debit and credit individual accounts at will. The entire market order will be supplanted and it will be de facto communism. But hopefully not on my watch. Thanks for watching, folks. Check out the links in the description for all the sources to this video. To whom does your life belong? Who owns you? Most people instinctively answer, I own myself. But most people don't actually believe that. What does it mean to own something? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with that thing. What is yours you can use, you can trade, you can give away, you can destroy. So what does it mean to say you own yourself? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, with your time and your energy. If someone else had the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, your time and your energy, then he would be your owner and you would be his slave. So. Are you anyone's slave? Do you pay taxes? Do you feel obligated to obey whatever the politicians decide to call law? Do you imagine that someone else has the right to control you, to rule you? Do you vote? In every political election, you are asked to decide who you want owning you, but owning yourself is never one of the options offered. The only choice you are given is the choice of which politicians will coerce and control you by way of so-called regulation and legislation, and confiscate what you produce by way of taxation. Whoever wins, you will be extorted and dominated. When you vote, whether you win or not, you are accepting that someone else has the right to rule you. You are conceding the state's authority over you. You are agreeing that you are going to be someone's slave with the only question being which political master will own you. If you believe that you have an obligation to pay taxes, if you concede that it is up to someone else to decide how much of your earnings they will let you keep, then you are their slave. If you own yourself, you don't need the permission of anyone, any individual, any group, any collective, any country, any legislature, to run your own life make your own choices, and keep the fruits of your own labor. As long as the politicians see you voting, petitioning, protesting, and campaigning, begging for tax cuts, whining for different legislation, as long as they see you timidly obeying whatever commands they issue while begging them to change their so-called laws, then they know that they own you in mind and body. Writing or calling your congressman merely tells him that you still think he's important, that you still view him and his fellow parasites as authority, and that you still think it's his choice whether to let you be free or not. As long as you play their games and legitimize their system, obeying their so-called laws and paying their so-called taxes, acting as if they are your rightful lords and masters, the tyrants know they have nothing to fear. The slave master doesn't mind his slaves pitifully begging for mercy, as long as they keep obeying and keep producing wealth for the master to steal. 
Those in power aren't worried about elections or petitions. What they do fear is that one day their victims will realize the truth, will stop believing in the divine right of politicians, will stop calling liars and crooks lawmakers, We'll stop calling the tyrants mercenaries law enforcers. We'll stop believing that anyone has the right to rule them. We'll stop imagining authority where there is none. We'll realize that they own themselves. And we'll stop bowing to the parasitical anti-human beast called government. If you own your time and effort and the fruits of your labor, then stop asking nicely to be allowed to keep it. If you own yourself, then stop asking nicely for legislative permission to run your own life. If you actually believe in unalienable rights, in individual liberty, in freedom, then stop asking nicely for the sociopathic parasites to let you be free. For humanity to be free, people need to stop thinking, talking, and acting like slaves. Stop bowing to megalomaniacs. Stop paying tribute to sociopaths. Stop obeying political parasites. If you truly understand that you own yourself, then start acting like it. Promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. and liberty for all and we are back um we are back here with ken shorgen who joins us every other wednesday to talk about geopolitics and the uh economy i gotta turn off my <laughs> music and um we were talking about the um, increase in the interest rates um, and how basically the banking system kind of works in a way. Uh, but we have a lot of other things to talk about, one of which that I think is really important. We've talked about this, but they haven't really acted on it. But it seems they're acting on it and they're acting on it like full force in India uh, among other places, um, Venezuela, but India s sounds like what they're doing there is just get totally out of hand um, when it comes to pushing these cashless societies. Ken? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I concur. I thought you were still... Uh Sorry. Carrying yeah. Out. So, well, yeah. with India, from what I understand, is they, they've gone to the point of door-to-door yeah, there's you know, more to that. Law, let, but... let, let's uh, let's lay out the the whole scenario. Ninety eight percent of all commerce in India, one point three billion people, ninety eight percent commerce is done with cash. Right, we had talked about that b before yeah. as well. Um, and what ended up happening, of course, is if you're getting paid cash for your job, you and know, whatever. didn't didn't you also mention? Sorry to interrupt, but they also carry literally carry like gold jewelry a lot of gold just to hold on to gold yeah i mean gold is a intrinsic part of their culture um every gift every wedding every holiday their religious temples they give gold and, and it's not just for you know oh the jewelry looks looks nice it's for the actual value of the gold right exactly you they wear their wealth and here's the interesting thing is there is not a lot of say muggings or or theft like that because like, like here where you have people that if you got a big gold chain on they'll fucking rob you <laughs> exactly because everybody who's anybody has gold and if somebody is stealing it then everybody will mug that person and, and beat them down or kill them you know you don't mess with anybody's gold in india Except, of course, if you think you're the government, and we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, I actually, on another note, I was robbed of a gold chain, and I had a um, a gold cross on it, even though I'm not religious. It's the only thing that would fit on that chain. Um, a gold bracelet, and for some reason, I they didn't get my ring, although I ended up losing it like five years later, or maybe even eight years later. I had it for a while, but anyway... Yeah, I was actually uh, robbed of my gold. So, um, 
among other things, my wallet, but I only had like 20 bucks in it. But they could have at least left my wallet. But anyway. Yeah. Well, so anyway, 98% of, uh, of all transactions, all commerce is done with cash. What this means is also is that, say, maybe 30% even have bank accounts. It also means that there's no such thing as direct deposit. So how can the government get taxes from you if you're getting paid cash from the business or company you work for? Well, so, only so those wait, who work wait, for the corporations. J- just, I don't know if I, I, I missed that. Sorry, uh, or if I was spacing out, but... So they don't take um, when they pay them. Did you say they pay them in cash or well, do they, they don't is, take is the taxes out beforehand like they do here? Correct. I mean, well, they do. If you work for a corporation, say, say you're one of those uh, Indians working customer service, you know, that we right, all hate. Right. Yeah. For thing. yeah. If you're <laughs> that we all you're hate. Gonna, you're going to take taxes out and you're going to do that. But most, you know, most if people gotta, don't if you get a little shop. Right. If you get a little shop that you're selling fruit from or whatever, which is most of the, the con- I mean, you have villages right, where right. I see an ATM. I understand what you're saying. That that's, mo- most right. of the commerce that's done, the majority of the people, although that's probably increasing with all the businesses that are going to India, uh, but the majority of people still have you know small independent businesses where they don't um, have taxes uh, taken out because they're working a cash business and it's their business. So if they were to pay taxes, they would pay them, you know, later if they were to pay them at all. Correct. And the kicker, the kicker of course, is that um, with most people not having banks, the government and the banks can't monitor transactions. Uh, So what they've done is, They've called everything I think that, I think that's, that's outside great. the banking system. Uh, not to interrupt, but I, I think that's great. And that's I wish we would go, you know, 90-something percent cash. I wish we would, had the ability to have all these small businesses, which we really don't because of the barriers to entry. Although the Internet is the only thing that really uh, doesn't have big barriers to entry. But um, not that I want to move to India. Don't get me wrong. I do not want to move to India. However, you know, here we're getting to a point where corporations are taking over every fucking industry and it's smaller and smaller corporations. The media being an example of of uh, and I heard you say today you you came up with a new name for the media, the fake media. I call them the government media. Same difference. They're both fake. Uh, but, you know, it's like six companies that own 95 percent of all media. That includes radio, newspaper, even search engines. So um, it's just fucked up. But I just wanted to bring up that point again, um, that in a way, part of that is a positive thing. Now, India, again, is not a country I want to fucking even go to because I had a bunch of co-workers go there, um, including uh, my ex-girlfriend who loves it there. But um at least in that sense, you know, that's where we need to go back to in, in, in uh, to an extent. Oh, let me tell you something. If, if you're if you're white, especially if you're a white woman. Oh, man, they worship you in. Uh, in, in oh, trust India. me. I, I know. They I still, fucking they I still have a caste. System. Don't even bring that caste shit up because the light, lighter you are. You are on the top. of the li- run, li- Listen, the you are at the bottom of the run. right. Right. Listen, fucking. You had these fucking Indians calling and texting my fucking girlfriend at the time, calling her love and shit like that. And I happened to see her phone and I'm like, what the fuck is this? And she was obsessed with Indians and fucking I, I uh, that's a whole nother fucking story. But uh, that really fucking pissed me off. But anyway, <laughs> anyway I'm sorry. Continue. As they say, you digress. Um, so, right. so anyway. <laughs> Uh, what here, here's something else that you got to take in consideration too, okay? If only thirty percent have bank bank accounts, an even smaller percentage have debit or credit cards. What do they and do? That means that, that with, means that businesses uh, hold on for do a sec. Sorry, j- point j- of sale systems. J- just so everybody knows, so what do they do with uh, bills? Do they just you know like say electric and TV? Do they just pick show up and pay them in cash or? There you go. And a lot of people, you know, and we should go back to fucking doing this, use money orders, you know, instead of even having a bank account at all, a lot of people, I'm sorry. 
Well, that requires a bank, but to tell no, the it doesn't. Was, no, no, you no. you go and buy a money order in cash. Well, you don't even need to do that today. You can go to a place like Carrot Bars or Gold Money. You can put all your money into gold. You get a debit debit card from them, and you yeah, can but you spend still got money as gold, and it's not in a banking system. You still got a debit card. I'm not saying it's a, it's a negative um, thing. I know we we've talked about it and everything, but I'm just saying that the point the point being is that. You with cash can buy money orders. You don't have to even have a checking account if you don't want to. Right. Yeah. So you yeah, can go you can. totally out of the, you know, and you can get paid in a in a, in a check from your job. Go to uh hopefully your job uses a big bank. You could go to that bank, they'll cash your check, and then you can pay all your bills and money in with money orders. I haven't gone that far. Where, you know, I still keep a checking account to pay my bills that way because I'm not worried about them, you know, stealing, you know, a thousand dollars or less or something. Um, You know, that's not a lot of money, but still, I'm just making a point that, you know, you can you can pay everything with fucking money orders if you really want to. Oh, sure. Or or you could just keep bare amount of money each month that you get well that's what i your bills, right right that's what i do on, do online pay so yeah hey, that's what, exactly what i do cost you money money orders are a pain yeah in the they, ass it, to go they are to, to be honest they are a pain in the ass you got to send them you got to pay like 75 cents to a dollar depending on where you get them some places two dollars but you can get them for 75 cents but yeah what i do is i pay all my bills online and and i keep a checking account and keep a minimal amount of money in it exactly right. that's exactly take, take what i do out, uh, do you know put it in some type of asset uh, you know whether you want to store it in gold and silver or if you want to you know put it in the stocks put it in real estate i, w- I, I can't touch something. stocks or real estate at this point just because um i think shit is gonna crash we had talked about not to change the subject but uh i i think it was the not last week but the last our last show um two weeks ago we we were talking about how the housing prices uh have have all of a sudden went way up and they're getting closer to where they were um years ago which is yeah, insane they, they the point of 2006 yeah right but i that, mean they're not that, that high but they're close because but it goes back to what i said the, when you have monetary uh, expansion, monetary inflation, it raises all asset prices above right. what their real value is. Well, my point, my point being is that I wouldn't touch any of that shit. I would only touch the stock market if I knew where. We, and we talked about this. If you know, and and I think you you do this, but where you know where the people are putting their money, the billionaires oh, and the you know, yeah, well, and you exactly, follow them. You, Yes and no. Um, the most money is made in the stock market where nobody's going, where everybody slams it down and says, you know, uh, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. It right. causes those prices to go. Well, not everybody, but back. what I mean is if you know the – basically, if you know the corruption, however you figure it out, yeah. you know, you can yeah, make money. Here's, here's, a, here's a little secret, though, about following the, the billionaires and that. The billionaires have the inside information long before the price actually moves up, and what oh, they'll yeah, do because is they get insider it. information. They'll, yeah, and and say say they get insider information in July for a stock, they'll and, start and, buying and, and, a little bit of time, a little bit of time, a little bit of time, a little bit of time. Then they've right. accumulated what they want. Now all of a sudden they'll go on CNBC. Warren Buffett will say, "Oh yeah, the uh, railroads are doing really well." Or the I'm I'm going to invest. He said he'll say, "I'm going to invest in uh, aircraft." Well, guess what? He doesn't have to report what Berkshire Hathaway purchases or he personally for right. like three months. So he slowly accumulated over the three months. The price really hasn't moved a lot. And then he comes and says, yeah, I'm going to invest in, in uh, aircraft. Yeah, you know, Boom, this the next day he reports fucker. it. Everybody gets in the aircraft. His, he, he collects all the profit while everybody's chasing a, a dream. You know, this fucker uh, actually bought Nevada Power and is buying up all the power companies, which sure. is very dangerous because he's somebody who, you know, would dismantle, um, you know, shut, shut them down um or try to convert them to something that would be very expensive and with this uh you know 
new updated Agenda 21 bullshit that they're really trying to promote, as I had mentioned uh, to you before. I don't know if you recall, but they did a whole big commercial with all these celebrities, which oh, sure. which is, is crazy for the U.N. to do. Let me do, tell you something. But in, in, in the world today, you do not I – mean, the people who get wealthy without – selling themselves to the establishment and the, and the powers that be the amount of it's people who get wealthy very are small few and far between yeah all these people that no are at doubt. the top of the list um they've sold their souls and yeah no doubt i, I like, totally agree with like you bill, Ga- bill gates uh his father was uh was a e- eugenicist and he's his vaccine programs in africa that he always touts about oh to kill people yeah people right and left uh, Warren Buffett. Well, he talked know. about he, he talked about depopulation in general. He talked about getting rid of like half the population in some of his speeches. Exactly. This is not shit that all of these basically, and in what you're saying, all of these foundations that are founded by billionaires, they are all evil. They're fronts right. for something else. Whether it's the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation. Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is behind Common Core. I mean, there's all this shit, but um, I, I don't want to drone on about this. Uh, let's get back to uh, India, yeah, as you get were back saying. To India. Okay, uh, so with the the commerce being 98 percent, people don't have bank accounts. Uh, businesses, very few, except maybe like the huge grocery stores or retailers, uh, except credit or debit cards. So it doesn't have a lot of electronic banking. Um, what this, of course, does is it makes India much more difficult right. to function in the global economy because they don't have that electronic banking and global scale. What is the ra- rationale, first of all, of and, – and we we talked about this a little before, but that's where I don't get – you know, like Canada, I played that clip. I don't know if you heard it, but that guy was from Canada, and I, I he had talked about – I don't know if he said it in that, but I might have heard it in another clip that Canada – 60% of their transactions are done with the, uh, you know, cashless. So right. a, a country like Canada or even the U.S., it wouldn't be as hard. But you're talking about a country based on, you know, uh, what uh, your, the stati- well, not actual statistics, but just the, the lay of the land and how things work there, that it's nearly impossible Yeah, to you do. have at least a third. 300 million people in India who live like uh, those rednecks did in the movie Defiant. Yeah, and they're the you second, uh, I believe, most pop, uh, most populated country in the world behind China. Correct. So Correct. how how do they expect to do this? They don't. Governments do things out of desperation, not out of logic. So now, what is their – before we get to the you know martial law type shit that they're getting to, what is the rationale and what is the desperation? The in, rationale in the, is to take away their form of money, and that's what Modi did. Modi took their highest denominated bills. Yeah, I got rid of and them. And he right? said – and he said instantly. He said, and that's the leader that of uh, India, right, Modi? What, what's his – is that his full yeah. name? No, I don't. I, he's got a funky first name. Is prime he minister there? Modi. They have a prime minister. Okay. Yeah, Prime Minister Modi. Um, so cool, he cool declared M O D I. Cool Modi. Yeah. Um, anyway, he he declared the top two denominational bills no longer legal tender, not recognized as for trade. So he was right. trying to scare the businesses into not accepting them, and he gave everybody till December fifteenth to turn in their money. Well, what he also did was the fact of the matter is their hundred and their two, their five hundred uh, rupee bills, the ones they got rid of, were or I think it was the five hundred and the thousand. Those and, were only worth about seven U.S. dollars and fourteen. Yeah, US dollars. they were. I know they were really cheap when we talked about it before. But and India does not. Uh, they don't allow guns at all, do they? Uh, I don't know their gun rules, but because I remember the talking to, I worked with some Indian people. One was actually uh, we became uh, pretty close, and I believe that now they might have. Maybe you can get a rifle or something, but 
But I believe for the most part that India is pretty much disarmed, uh, meaning that, you know, of course, if uh, government wants to go house to house or do do whatever, there's no there's nothing you can really do. Pretty much. And, and they're they're disarming because they used to be a British colony until the late 1930s. So that's where it came from. They just never allowed people to have guns anymore. Um, actually, there was a time when they did have guns, but that was before India broke off into Pakistan, you know, Muslim Pakistan and Hindu India. Uh, at following the the getting rid of the uh, Britain as a colony, but that being said, uh, when you when you get rid of those two denominated bills, what it does is it psychologically keeps people from holding money because if you could have your money in higher denomination bills, then you only need a few of them. If you get rid of the high denomination bills and people still want to hold cash, they're going to be walking around with like crate loads of uh, you know hundred. 50 you know 50 and hundreds that are worth maybe a dollar 20 a piece and they're not gonna be able to do commerce in that because you know it it'd be like if there was hyperinflation you're wheelbarrowing your money everywhere you have to go so he was going to try to spook people into getting into banks but uh the people of course rebelled and they what they did was they took all their hundreds and instead of going to the bank and depositing them and getting rid of them by december 15th they all ran to their jewelers and said this you know the the rumors of that they're going to confiscate and get rid of gold. He's you know India's been trying to get rid of gold for the last just uh, a, two or three years. Just so, a quick um in addition to that uh, because this kind of goes along with it because I believe this article is recent. Uh, this is from the Washington Post. It says India already has some of the world's strictest gun laws. Now it's even tight tightening them more. And to me, that would go along with what they're trying to do. You know, uh, if they have any guns at all, it would make sense for them to tighten them based on uh, what they're trying to do there. So essentially what they're trying to do is push people into the banks. They're Correct. trying. They want people to use banks. Correct. So and, and what they've, the, did now, something happen prior to that that – and you might have said it and I might have missed it – that, you know – um made them uh, or made the prime minister all of a sudden want people to use fucking banks here is the here is the the belief okay here's the rumor going around strong rumor modi prime minister modi when he came into office he came in as a populist you know like he was the ron paul of uh of uh, India, the previous At least prime minister acted like it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The previous prime minister had put import taxes on the importation of gold, and so smuggling was like monstrous. There was ten percent on top of uh, the normal import duties and price, and they were trying to dissuade people from from doing gold. Well, since Modi's come in, the first thing he did was he's telling people and the temples, you know, the temples hold the most gold in India. Uh, they're telling you, hey, deposit your gold with with us at the central bank, and we'll give you uh, a percentage of interest, and then you'll get your gold back after 10 years. Like, we really want to believe that. Well, out of all that, I think they got three tons out of, say, 30,000 tons, you know. Didn't give anything. So then people, once they started realizing that Modi was not – uh, for the people, and he was not for allowing that them to have That he's just gold. like every other lying politician. And and remember this, India is part of the BRICS. The BRICS were the emerging markets that sort of rebelled against the United States, the dollar, and dollar hegemony. Right. Um, Brazil, and look look what's happened to Brazil. They impe- you know impeached their uh, prime Min- or their president for flimsy things, and they put in a CIA schlub. Who's a, as corrupt as the days young? South Africa. Yeah, did, didn't that have to do with? Do, didn't that have to do with the CIA influencing that? Well, yeah, yeah. So basic, basically, that the CIA uh, got them to, um, to get him out of Rusev. office. Oh, her. Oh, her. Sorry. Yeah, Rusev. Uh, it's not Danielle, but it's something like yeah, that. Yeah, so they they you know, it, but they didn't they didn't have they didn't kill her, right? They just uh No, they they trumped up charges and uh Oh, the they put her in jail. 
the people are uneducated and ignorant and they started, you know, all, it's just like the Maidan coup in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, you, you pay a few, uh, few interlopers. They start uh, spreading lies and rumors. You get a bunch of protesters. So they did the em- economic hitman uh, kind yeah, exactly. of thing where they and go they, in with the money and spread it around and then they, they, they do, do it Russia, that way. They put sanctions. What they do to to uh, South Africa? Well, Russia, because they, they can't do much. When you when you're talking about you know countries like Russia, you can't go in and fucking assassinate Putin. You wouldn't be able to do it, and plus you'd start World War Three. So uh, right. you know. Well, the, and, and see, economic hitmen today it isn't necessarily about um, assassinations. No, it's. I mean, they send them in first. It's it, propaganda. It's propaganda. The, the, war this is how one of them explained it. And and uh, I think I talked to you about this off air that he explained it as, you know, first they go in and they try to, you know, spread money around and do that type of thing or pay off the person who's in charge or, you know, do something like that. Then they go to, you know, the jackals and all that whole thing with the CIA and then they go to war if they follow it all the way through or they not necessarily go to war, but they can, you know, um do a covert operation like they've done in the middle east where they just you know kidnap people in the middle of the night and stuff like that but sometimes that doesn't that that doesn't work that middle part where they try to um you know get them kill them or you know kidnap them or whatever and then they decide you know do they want to go to war or whatever i guess it depends how important it is but um yeah, I guess in the in the case with Brazil, they didn't even have to go that far, right? Not that I'm saying that they maybe but even would. What, they're, what but they're doing is what they're doing is is they're they're, they're bringing attacking. internal domestic. They're attacking problems. all the BRICS countries. All the they're BRICS going countries. After South them. Africa. South Africa has, has pretty much fallen, you know, economically. And even apart. even it was rumored um, that you, I think you had brought this up uh, as well that with France that that may have been a false flag because France was getting too close with Russia and there were a couple uh, attacks that had happened over there and that the, you know, CIA might have been involved in that because of France getting, you know, in with Russia. Oh, sure. Uh, If people just want to go out and check out Operation Gladio, yeah, that on. was with a Cuban. Uh, no, 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 right? no. That that was in Italy. That was the Red Brigade. That was all the terrorism that took place in the sixties and seventies in France, Italy, Germany. What it and they used that to blame it on the Russians. It was a way to keep Europe from moving oh, into okay. the Soviet Union. What camp. was what was the one where they came up with all this stuff that they were going to do and blame it on Cuba? Was that Operation North? No, not Northwoods. Oh, it may have been, but... Uh... Well, because they, they that was another operation where they didn't actually follow through with it, but they came up with all these false flags, uh, false flag attacks that they were going to do in the United States, and they were going to blame it on Cuba as a reason to attack Cuba. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure the CIA tried tried a, a number of these things. Yeah, they did. Um, I mean, yeah. it, what haven't they done? But... um. Sorry, continue. Pretty, pretty much. So anyway, with uh, with India, what is happening is, of course, people are rebelling. They're trying to trade in their their um, rupee bills, in, not to the bank, but to jewelers. They're buying gold at any price, which has driven up the co- the price of gold. And some people have said from from the ground there that it's the equivalent of uh, thirty six hundred U S dollars per ounce. And then, of course, Modi then took it to the next step and realized that people were not turning in their bills. So he cut off the December 15th date and he started going after uh, anybody who he thought under the guise of you are a black market uh, marketer and started doing raids. And in the raids, they stole uh, a drug dealer or terrorist or whatever. They confiscated the cash. They confiscated any gold and jewelry. They took anything of wealth. And, you know, it's, it's the equivalent of civil forfeiture. Prove that it's uh, not used in black market. Well, com- today... Which is insane. Today, it's, today it's just... commerce that is not 
controlled and regulated by the government is considered black market. If they if can't, would, yeah, if, if they if they can't track you, your transactions, it's like it, it's it's it means that you know you've done something illegal. You have to prove. Um, Glenn Beck actually made uh, once in a while when I'm driving to work, I'll listen, had said, because he had talked to somebody, if you keep cash to keep the fucking receipts from the bank that you withdrew the cash from the bank to be able, so you can prove that. Um, and you can always go to your bank statement and show, you know, whatever. But it's like you have to prove that money that you earn from fucking work uh, that you uh, actually earned it. And didn't earn it illegally because it's cash. And with right. all the government, I mean, we know that the government spies on people, can turn on your fucking uh, camera on your computer, can turn your phone on and listen to your converse. I mean, we know how far they can go with all this shit. And people don't want them tracking their transactions. And that means, oh, you must be a criminal. I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, that's what the propaganda and the thing is. Yeah. The thing is, is we're in it. We're in a sea change. People no longer believe the the fake news of the mainstream media. They proved that in the election. They're not believing this Russian hack of the th- of the thing. People, are, you know, it's uh, the 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 recounts are being backfired. The uh, demand for uh, getting rid of the hundred dollar bill and, and cashless society. This is getting rejected. It's a growing thing. You know, the Italian referendum that was just passed, these are growing rebellions. The people didn't turn in the money as Modi wanted to. They bought gold. See, this is the, the establishment is losing ground. It's not happening um, as as fast as we might think, but it's a growing thing. So, so what's going on in India? Has there been any other reaction as far as, you know, protesting or, I mean— doing it i mean they don't have guns so they're screwed there but they're 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 still trying to to figure things out but if uh if these raids continue then there will be not only massive protests but you could have complete breakdown of society and civil war you don't mess with an indian's gold period but that's where the fact that they barely have any guns makes a fucking difference when has guns been the determinant well i'm not i'm not saying that that's going to stop them but let me what, tell you something on the internet and you can figure out from your house well like in egypt they didn't have bombs. guns i know i but, hate to say it but but on the internet you can find out from your household cleaners how to make bombs you don't need guns well true but but my point being though is that and the indians are all engineers <laughs> yeah i guess but uh, um that's how you can that, – that's why, you know, it's so important to the United States government to get guns away from people because they they know once they get to that point, you know, it's going to be a lot harder. Now, like you said, you know, yeah, obviously there's other things they can do. In Egypt, they had like a million people in the street. I don't know if that was – orchestrated by you know billionaires or the cia or whatever but you know there's there are other things you can do but it's a lot easier to have a fucking you know ar-15 than to go you know try to figure out uh or get the supplies and make uh bombs and whatever or you know little molotov cocktails you can make a gun with a 3D printer now. Well, true, but you have to have a 3D printer, and I don't know how and many of these India, people have India 3D is printers. Highly technical. I mean, they are they have they have the technology. Look, if there's a need, yeah, but those people know, have probably have bank accounts. Is the mother of invention. If, if the if the the shit hits the fan, you can guarantee that they will find a way. Let me no, tell you I'm something. not saying they won't. I'm just saying it's easier gun, with a gun. Have, look, you can't have guns in Mexico. And how does know. everybody who you know whatever get guns? Let me tell you something. Well, just because something is illegal doesn't mean you can't get it neither. Chicago. So that's a good Ch- point. Chicago, Chicago has the strictest gun gun rules next to Washington D.C. in the country. Well, California and every, every, is pretty uh, bad too. Oh, Cal- I, Massachusetts no, I, is really bad. But yeah, <laughs> it's it's up there with and you know what? with. They have more gun deaths than, than anybody because every gangbanger has a gun because they can get guns in. If the stuff hits the fan, 
there's not enough government officials and bureaucrats uh, in relation to the people to stop it. And they know this. That's why they – this is why – Right, but it's still easier if you go back to, to if you go back to a lot of the 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 books at the time, like uh, Brave New World, or Orwell's nineteen eighty four, or a lot of those. They came to a realization, okay, in the sixties during their their tests on people during the the revolution, the hippie movement. They realized that jackboot thuggery only works for a short period of time. Right. It, it That's why tactics. America has done what they've done. They they, they they use different tactics. See, when 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 the National Guard killed those four students at Kent State, the outcry was so great they had to whoa, and they didn't do it again. They didn't send in troops again anywhere. Unfortunately, okay. I don't think the outcry would maybe, be the same today. But well, the 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 real the point is. Is that well? Take a look at uh, the. Bundy. My only point is. Look at, look at the Bundy Ranch. Look at the Bundy I, Ranch. I know they all they all had a bunch of guns, and yeah, nothing exactly. happens. And the, and the feds back down. Exactly. Because they, don't because have they had a bunch of guns. To face, face the public. My, my only point is just that it's you know it's easier if you have a bunch of guns. That's all I'm saying. It, well, you know what I mean? Them. Compared to not. I know we guns. do, but I'm talking yeah. about India not having them. That doesn't oh. mean they can't do anything. But yeah, I'm but saying that the government on, feels on, better if they Pakistan. don't. You think that? Do you think Pakistan, which is a terror terror organization? Yeah, I mean they could get they guns get from guns Pakistan, Pakistan yeah. and they could get you know whatever. But what I'm saying is, it's just you know already having them and and whatever is you know it just makes it easier. Is all I'm saying. But um, so in Venezuela, um, they're doing similar kind of things but they're eliminating uh bills yeah venezuela has now decided because they're hyperinflation or they're they're high inflation it's not quite hyperinflation hyperinflation is what's considered exponential that means that if you uh if you bought a bottle of wine at lunch by the time you were finished eating uh it would cost like five times more (laughs) that's hyperinflation (laughs) um high inflation they're at 750 percent inflation and uh, people, you know, their their highest denominated bill, the hundred Boulevard. It's the Bernie Sanders economy, though. Well, there you go. Yeah, but but Bernie would do it differently, though. Yeah, Bernie's would work. It would be great. Bernie's would work as long as people had confidence in the dollar. But once it was no longer the reserve currency, we'd look like Venezuela. Period. Um. Anyway, the hundred Boulevard denomination is worth right now about three cents, three U.S. cents. Okay, that's so probably it. That. Probably costs more to print it. Here's what people were doing: people were running every weekend. They were running to the Colombian border, and they were just going across the border and taking their uh, Boulevard currency and buying food and buying a few goods. Well, here's the kicker: when your when your currency becomes hyperinflated and virtually worthless, okay, you can't afford to buy anything domestically. So a government will take all your goods, agriculture, foodstuffs, everything you produce, and they will export it so they can get in hard currency, currency that isn't hyperinflated, okay? Well, that's what they did with Colombia. The reason that the Venezuelans don't have enough food and don't have any everything because the government confiscated it all and is selling it to uh, mar- you know, uh, marketers and businesses in Colombia. And guess what? When people cross over the border to get food and get whatever, they're buying their own stuff. <laughs> That's so fucked. It is, but th- welcome, welcome to what happens S- when socialism you- or communism socialism, or whatever yeah. the fuck it is. And it's not the type of because they always say, well, it's not like you know Russia or China when where all these people died or were were killed or whatever. Um, because oh, Bernie's. People, people, people are dying. I'm sure. Tens of thousands. But... Their zoos are completely empty because the people have already gone in and killed all the animals and for food. ate them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They killed. There's no pets around. They killed and ate all their pets. But here's the thing. I'm going to start eating people soon. In Venezuela, okay, the dollar really won't buy you much. The uh, the Bolivar won't buy you much, but guess what will? People sniff gold and silver, and you can virtually buy the kingdom. 
I wrote an article from somebody who has a uh, who's a his brother is a missionary in Venezuela, and this is from three or four months ago. This is three or four months ago. He said that we have instances where um, retailers, if you had one ounce of silver, they would sell you three to four months worth of food for your entire family. If you had an ounce of gold, you could buy a moderate sized house. People would sell it to you just so they could get hard money, hard currency, sound money. Damn. So this is why you have gold and silver. And, you, you know, you could say, well, this is America. It would never happen. Well, you know what? In uh, 1913, well, we I, had, don't, I don't say that. In but. 1913, we had the, the or 1907, we had a bank panic. Guess what? There were places all across the country that had no money. Yeah, but that that that, that was a a, mani a manipulation. That was a uh, propagandized bank panic. Right. It was a but, setup. But the the recessions and bank panics from 1871 through 1907 and 1929. Remember when they closed down the the? See, this is something that people don't realize. It has not been a hundred years since we had a two week bank holiday where you couldn't get your money anyway. Of course, most people alive were never around in 1928 or 1932, 1933. Right. There were some, but the vast majority of generations have never gone through this. Uh, what else have you know? Most of most of the people working today never went through the uh, the oil crisis of 1973. The long lines of oil, you know, or trying to get gas. Where you were relegated to well, my mom um, did. Depending on uh, your, your license plate, you you could only get gas on even or odd days according to the yeah, number yeah. of your license. Plate. And the lines yeah, were three hours long. Okay, yeah, my you know my father had told me about that because the world rejected the dollar, and the Arabs OPEC wouldn't sell oil to the United States because they wouldn't take our dollar. This was only 1973. That's 43 years 43, ago. 43, yeah. And, well, guess what? These things go in cycles. The world is rejecting. I, I mean, take a look at this. Iran. Iran is has just signed an agreement that's going to take start taking place in 2017 with Russia to join the Eurasian Economic Union. Why is that important? It means Iran can trade with any of the EU members in their own currencies, bypassing the dollar. Right. They don't need to go through SWIFT. Well, what does that do for the for the United States, who is having this propaganda war against Iran? That means that economic sanctions no longer matter. And because Iran could just sell their oil and everything else to Russia in rubles and in in uh, dinar or rials. Rials. Uh, seven on Monday, seven countries signed up with China. To yeah, I was just going to bring that up. That they That's added three. Uh, Countries. More countries, yeah. Yeah, twenty-three countries that they keep are now adding them. With China bypassing the dollar. The yeah, days of the and that Turkey doesn't want to use the U.S. dollar anymore neither. Turkey doesn't want yeah, to Tur trade Turkey in the U.S. The dollar neither. So, so the, uh, the that's the thing about it is, is the days of the dollar are going away. What you need to do is you need to find some type of asset that's going to be able to transition you. Gold you know, and silver, we go to the man. SDR, whether we go to a gold standard, whether we do, you know, have a new shice dollar, where they, where the United States has a domestic dollar that only we spend here, and an international dollar that, that's yeah. backed by something that for trade. I, I think everything should just. I, I know it's it's hard to carry around, but you can melt gold in different ways and whatever. And I know it's all about the weight, but I I want fucking to use the fucking gold. I don't trust a piece of paper that represents anything anymore at all. I want actual gold or silver or an actual asset that's used to purchase things because this piece of paper shit and they've already shown that obviously they can, you know, uh, go off of that standard or change it or do whatever. You know, they they changed it during uh, FDR where he upped it. So I, I would want an actual piece of gold and we all carry gold and silver whether it's annoying to carry or not you know they can make them in all different denominations and smaller and bigger and whatever and to base everything off of that because that makes the most sense to me i mean what are you going to carry around fucking oil i mean you know so 
I won't, but I don't want to carry around something that represents something else because yeah, I don't here, trust the, that shit. Here, here's here's an interesting thing. Um, if you if you want to do some re- really interesting study about the Fed, the reasons behind going off the gold standard and and things like that, when Woodrow Wilson pushed everything into the into the Fed, go to a place called Road to Ruta. Road to T O R O O T A. Okay. A gentleman named Bix Weir has done immense research taking documents that are on the Federal Reserve site, um, New York Times articles from 1913, 1914, uh, w- memoirs coming from Woodrow Wilson himself in the, in the, <clears throat> about between 1910 and 1914. Well, I thought he was bought and paid for, and a lot of that was in the uh, oh, he was, Wilson. He was, that that a lot of that is in the Creature from Jekyll Island, right? Book. But the Creature of Jekyll Island doesn't have the whole story. Um, between 1910 and 1914, explorers discovered, and remember, Arizona only became a state in 1912. Okay? Really, it didn't become yeah. before that because Nevada was like 18. 18- <laughs> 50 80. or 1860 or something yeah and the reason that it became a state was because of the comstock load it became so wealthy and so many people you have to have a certain amount of population it had a lot of silver before you could change from territory yeah that was the comstock load largest silver discovery in the history of the world um the you have to have a certain amount of population and certain establishment before you can move from a territory to a state that's why nevada um did it before Montana, Idaho, and a number of other places. Arizona, you know, the only reason it took so long is because most of Arizona's little towns were like Mormon watering holes. It's where the Mormons came from uh, Nouveau, Illinois, on their way to Utah. And Mesa, Arizona is a watering hole. Las Vegas started as Mormon watering hole, that type thing. That's a fucked up direction to take. Well, to anyway, Utah, but whatever. Well, actually, no, that's not true. You can go. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Between 1910 and 1914, they discovered a uh, massive gold discovery in the Grand Canyon. So great. I mean, talking so great. We we have maybe, you know, say we, we have 261 million ounces of gold at the New York Fed, supposedly the uh, Fort Knox gold supply. Think of uh, a million or more tons, not ounces, tons of gold. That's how much they estimate is in Grand Canyon. That much gold would have instantly destroyed the world's financial system. You know, because if you have if you have too much supply of, of anything, then that becomes worthless. Right. It wouldn't be. So yeah. what they decided to do was they cordoned off that part of the and, – and if if you ever do a lot of exploring in the uh, Grand Canyon, there are certain areas you're not allowed to go to, and they've got Marines that with guns that keep you from going in there. So they decided to cordon that off and um, instead went to a fractional reserve system, mostly because Alan Greenspan in the 1950s, 1960s, before he was Fed chairman, he just worked at the Fed – he was a computer programmer as well as a an economist. I mean, he, Greenspan, to tell the truth, was brilliant. He was also he used to be uh, like a libertarian. He was a mentor. He, he was his mentor was Ayn Rand. Well, there, Ayn it, Rand. There you go. So, and and but he then was, when he beat when he came, uh, you know, Fed chairman, he totally changed uh, his tune yeah, there. Yes and no, but I'll tell you why he changed. Okay. When they discovered they had this this gold supply, what what they wanted to do was they knew eventually they would have to go to a return to gold standard. But following Bretton Woods and all that in 1946, but the world wasn't ready for it yet. So they needed to do this. They needed to find money to help rebuild Europe, i.e. the Marshall Plan. They had to bring uh, reindustrialized China and Japan and Germany after the war. They had to re- they had to bring the world into this modern age. Now, part of it was is that they wanted to bring about one world government, provide the means to do that, but they also wanted to create a monetary system based on fiat currency 
expand it as far as it could go until it collapses, but use that money to create the technology and the infrastructure and the society we have, because they knew that once it collapsed, they had this, this uh, reserves of gold that they could just take out and redistribute not only to the nations around the world, but it was enough to distribute directly to the people, get rid of the fiat currency system, and then start over. But guess what? You have the technology and the infrastructure already in place. That's what the road to Ruta, and the road to Ruta is root A, which for anybody who is a basic, uh, basic computer programmer, the language, root A is part of that. That's why it was called Road to Ruta, and this was written, by the way, this isn't just something that floats around on the, uh, on the Fed, Federal Reserve websites, the St. Louis Fed. The Road to Ruta was the doctoral thesis for Alan Greenspan on how you should take a fiat currency system to its maximum using electronic banking. And he was, the, he was one of the two programmers who created electronic banking. If you remember uh, stories, we used to do stocks in you know, one-eighth fractionals. Remember, he said, and the, and the Dow uh, grew 56 and one-eighth today. Right. Well, it was his electronic banking system that he programmed that changed it all to digital, which then allowed for this digital expansion of money. This is also the reason for the petrodollar, because contrary to popular belief, we did not go off the gold standard. We may think we did, but we didn't. And here's the reason why. All Nixon did with his executive order was close the gold window which meant that anybody who had dollars could no longer exchange their dollars for gold. But they didn't get rid of their 8,100 8, tons of gold. As a matter of fact, the 8,100 tons of gold have always stayed relatively the same because it's sort of a collateral, even though it's fractionalized, it's sort of a collateral for the amount of money that we have in the system. Yeah, but with all the money that they printed, does it even come out e to being e able to back that much money? Well, and this is also why you've seen the price of gold go up. It's yeah. no longer so, it's not forty two dollars and twenty two cents, which the right. treasury has. It's it's whatever. So if you it, if you know. base it off of that, I would assume there's no way that the amount of gold that they have would back the amount of currency that's out there. Except if you if it's correct that they have a million tons hidden in the Grand Canyon to well, be excavated. Yeah, I guess. Okay, it's like true. I said, this is, this is there. there is some, you know, when you take a look at what they've done to the financial system and you listen to the Fed, okay, anybody, you don't have to have a fifth grade education to sit there and go, these guys are just freaking idiots, you know, um, to create these bubbles and create debt. You and I, you and I from the very beginning when we were kids were told, you know what? Debt is debt is bad. You know, you don't want to be in debt. It, it's servitude. It 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 keeps you from doing what you want to do because it's a bondage. You know, kids kids who have all these student loans, they can't afford to buy homes. They can't even afford to get married and have kids because there's no jobs to do it. But what uh, China? See, this is one of the things about China. China's got as much uh, regular you know regular debt as the United States does. Their biggest thing is it's all internal. They could eliminate it with a stroke of a pen. The United right. States, the U.S. 14, owes. Uh, what, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, you fourteen were to say like twenty 14. trillion yeah. is offshore, and a and lot it's of it's to China. <laughs> China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, which has three trillion, you know that type of thing. This is, and this is one of the reasons why, after they closed the gold window, people said, "Whoa, well, you know, you're, you're, we lost confidence in your dollar. We don't want it." It led, of course, to everybody rejecting the dollar, sending them back. The Arabs and OPEC didn't want to take dollars for gold or for, for oil. So that's when Kissinger went over and said, OK, um, we've got to create a new system that will allow us to expand our money supply far greater than gold would ever do. And thus, oil was you know, without limit at the time. And so that's why they backed the currency with oil, because, you know, they allowed them then to expand it as far as they wanted, because everybody needed energy. Every single thing that functions on this planet, from whether planting crops, uh, reaping crops, getting in your car to buy, 
to buy food, cooking the food, eating the food. Everything takes energy. What so you- energy is the greatest greatest commodity in the Fine, world but they, they should have never been in that position in the first place and they should have never spent the probably billions that were spent on the vietnam right. war it's, it's not combination. to mention all the money that they spent just in general and how the federal government started becoming so powerful because of all the money that they got but i i i know uh we're basically out of time but they, there was a bunch of stuff that i wanted to go through so if you can just kind of summarize uh the last couple days or or your last couple podcasts um real quick uh, into you know the important things um i appreciate list, it just, just throw out throw out a uh, quick topic and i'll explain it through and i'll finish those through things uh, those up okay so I know gold is at a five-year uh, demand high, from what I understand. Um, the COMEX and Islam, I don't know if you want to talk about that real real quick. COMEX and Islam. That I their exactly. Sharia law wouldn't allow them oh, okay, to. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Shari- sh- um, back uh, a couple months ago, two, three months ago, the head, it's the A A A O I F I. Like I said, it's a syn- uh, uh, anagram. I don't know the whole thing. Anyway, they're in charge of Sharia law finance for the entire Islamic world. And because Islam does not believe in usury interest, for the longest time, they have been not been allowed to get involved in gold or gold products. They could own gold if it was a currency, recognized currency. They could own gold as jewelry, but they couldn't buy futures contracts. They couldn't buy mining stocks. They couldn't buy derivatives. They they couldn't do anything with gold. Um, So now they've approved uh, a a large majority of different things that they can purchase gold with, which is now going to allow up to 1.6 billion people around the around the world and 330 million who are active investors islamic active investors to get into the gold market and uh one of the, the big caveats in there is in this uh sharia law agreement is it says that islam and sharia law finance will play a part in determining the gold price why is that important? Because if the COMEX in London does not let Islam uh, have a say in the price, and you know that Islam is going to want to stop the, the manipulation, then they're going to simply just bypass London and the LBMA and the COMEX, and they're going to open their own new gold market in Dubai. So suddenly you will have two huge physical gold markets, Dubai, Shanghai, and the paper market is going to go by the wayside. So that's what's going on right. with that. And then you got uh, what's going on in Italy. Uh, Italy, the Italian referendum, uh, the people rejected that. Um, Ren, uh, President uh, or Premier Matteo Renzi resigned. It, uh, they had somebody from his political party fit in, but it's it's heading towards their banking system is, is failing. They want to do a bailout, but according to EU laws, they have to do a bail-in. What's uh, doing now is they're they're trying to sell debt to private uh, private entities who are going to buy it, but you know they 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 still owe so much secondary debt from trying to recapitalize over the last two years that nobody wants to buy their debt. And there were some bonds that were put out there. They're called cocoa bonds. Okay, these are these are interesting things, and this is going on all over Europe. Cocoa bonds. What it means is, is when you buy the bond, you get a promised set of interest. But if the bank fails and cannot pay those pay the those bonds, then the bonds turn into equity, i.e., shares in the bank. Well, if your bank is failing and your stock price has gone from say ten dollars a share down to fifty cents a share, and you've got these cocoa bonds and they're about to say, okay. We're transferring those cocoa bonds into equity, so now you have fifty cents worth of shares instead of your bonds. Everybody's trying to dump the bonds, so they're waiting for the the um, announcement that the cocoa bonds are going to be transferred into equity into stock, which then would mean that everybody who got that piece of crap stock is going to sell it even more. 
the market cap for the bank is going to go below a certain threshold and the bank's going to go insolvent. And it's going to start kicking then in the derivatives, which will go through all the Italian banks, the French banks, the German banks, etc. So that's the point that they're at. They're looking to see if they're going to kick in the cocoa bonds. Once that happens, then everybody's going to sell off the stock. The uh, capitalization is going to go below the required and it'll kick in the derivatives. So you see how it is. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, Italy knows the writing on the wall and the current uh, people that they've got in, they're going to have a new election. They're going to bring in possibly some really right wing radical uh, political parties <clears throat> that are anti-euro, anti-EU. And uh, the one thing that they're talking about right now is that Italy is going to vote against the next <clears throat> uh, next time sanctions or sanction vote are, is brought up in the uh, European Commission, and they want to join the Eurasian Economic Union. If they do that and they can do bilateral trade in their own currency, then they're going to ditch the euro. Once they start ditching the euro, the whole uh, European Union is going to fall apart. So. A lot of dominoes. Yeah. All you got to do is push one or two. Um, on a different note, you have uh, fast food uh, revenue dropping. Um, I don't yeah, know early, if we've... Well, ever, since, ever since March, um, volume and, and revenues at most restaurants, sit-down restaurants, like, say, Olive Garden, um, Red Lobster, these type of things, have been really declining. And, you know, people may not be able to buy new TVs, but many of them are too lazy and they'll go out and eat. Well, if they can't do the sit-down restaurants that cost them, say, 20 to $50 for their family or whatever, they'll sure enough buy fast food. Of course, if you got people who are working, you know, downtown, whatever city you're in, unless you actually fix your own lunch, most people will just step outside and go get a quick burger and fast food. Well, when fast food uh, revenues and volume are starting to decline, that means people and consumers are incredibly tight. They don't have any money. I make sandwiches. Yeah, well, that's you. But I'm talking about the vast most people. No, I know. So, I'm just saying I personally make sandwiches. Um, so people are now making their own lunches or they're going without and they're not even they're not even going to get the five or six dollar fast food lunch or meal. And when they can't even afford that, then you know that the consumer is really strapped. So these, this is a big bellwether indicator. Um, just a couple more things real quick. The I believe it was the value of the dollar is at a 14-year high. Yeah. The, the dollar, ever since the, the election of Donald Trump, the dollar has gone from 96 on the index to – it was just under 102 until today with the Fed. Um, and, and when it got over 101, that was the 13-year high. It had not been that high since uh, 2003, okay? And that was during the recession, and that was when Greenspan had uh, interest rates at 4.5%. That's when, he, in 2003, he started lowering interest rates down to 1%, created the housing bubble. And, of course, when you lower interest rates, the cost of – borrowing uh, decreases, more people borrow, and so the dollar gets uh, weaker because you're expanding the money supply. Well, if people aren't buying, you remember how I said that people are dumping bonds? That's right. one reason why the 10 years gone up. Well, when they're dumping bonds and nobody's buying treasuries and nobody wants the dollar, that means that the monetary base is declining. You know, it's it, And so when it declines, your the the strength of your currency goes up well the the bad part of it is 14 year high that means that for you me when we buy stuff our dollar buys more here in the united states what that means for say china it costs too much to buy our goods okay because their currency is much more devalued right so that's so why they're accepting the trade all deficit, this yeah, they, the trade deficit is going to go is going to skyrocket. That was another story that that was part of that, um, or not another story, but that was part of that as well. That you know they're they're uh, um, accepting all this other currency and also trying to you know uh, not trade 
with uh, the U.S. dollar and, you know, make things either within the country or trade with other currency. Right. And if the dollar is the dollar strong, that means that uh, commodities are cheaper. Um, you know, things like that. It's going to cost. You're going to see a lot of corporations have lower earnings because if they're not exporting anything, nobody's buying them because of the strong dollar. The, the economy declines, the GDP declines, the recession comes in. Well, so, luckily, I work for a, although they do come from other countries, but I work for a uh, hospitality uh, travel company. So, yeah. mostly people in the U.S. But, there but is, what it also means is that if you want to go on vacation, Europe is dirt cheap right now. Because the euro is down to 104. Well, that's good because they own uh, resorts in Europe and um, Japan. Well, no. Yeah, there's a resort in Japan, I think, as well. Let, um, let me tell you something. Right now, the, the peso in Mexico is at, at about 21 pesos to the dollar. And somebody like Angel Clark, who lives down there, her and uh, Jeff Berwick, uh, the dollar vigilante, if they get their income in dollars, they are living like kings you could live like a king for a thousand u.s dollars of income. just another note you know acapulco i was looking at the rankings of the most dangerous cities in the world and acapulco was in the top 10 just so you know i think it was like yeah, number it, three it jumped um, up there because of that uh that shooting and that kidnapping or whatever at the college yeah i don't know how they it was were like 40, ranking 40, 40 them, people but... jump jump their numbers way up oh. because 40 40 students but here's the thing about i've heard about acapulco is uh the people the people tell the cops to you know fuck off no um, yeah the, co the cops will pull you well. over and they'll just like give them the middle finger or whatever cops come knock on your door they just whatever the the cops are sort of scared they're not like they're not like bought off cartel they have to they have to be quite uh lenient because acapulco is a tourism town yeah. and the whole thing relies upon tourists and right, you start right. getting too much um you know brutality well so does vegas itself. but that doesn't stop the uh, las vegas police from killing the citizens that live here i guess they just don't kill the tourists but uh if they come to my door i'm gonna tell them to fuck off now of course i'm gonna <laughs> say it through the door i'm not opening the door but i'm gonna tell them to fuck off so Get a warrant. Um, oh. no, go ahead <laughs> I say, knock, knock. You got a warrant? No, fuck off. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to tell them to fuck off. <laughs> Even if they have a warrant, I'm going to tell them to fuck off. Anyways, um, I have some other things, but we'll end it on this, um, which is interesting, that I guess Time Magazine urges that the 65 million people that voted for Clinton should not pay their taxes. Now, I'm all for not paying taxes. I don't think anybody should pay their taxes, and I think it's extortion, but... That's just a ridiculous fucking mentality. It's just like the, you know, Trump is not my president. Well, to me, Trump is not my president neither, but neither is anybody else because I don't believe that the government has anything to do with me. It's just in over the land that I live in. So it doesn't matter if it's Trump or Clinton or Obama. None of them are my president. But they choose, to, oh, because it's Trump, he's not my president. Because Hillary didn't get elected, now I, I don't want to pay taxes. Now, if they did that, that would be positive. But I know you mentioned that 45% of uh, people pay zero in taxes, and probably a, a lot of those people voted for Hillary if well, they course. voted at all. The, the well, if they voted at all. The, the welfare crew that relies upon the government for their sustenance, they're going to vote uh, Democrat. And right, if they vote at all, in. though. Is what so I'm they saying, don't pay taxes anyway. So, it's, so they don't it, give a well, fuck. It's right. like this. It's like this. There are, four, there are 40 people right now, electors, okay, 40 electors that are demanding. We want to see the information the CIA has on Russian hacking of our, of our elections. Well, guess what? 39 of those 40 are all Democrat electors. No, They're from California, Maryland, whatever. So it's moot. Right. You're you're, you're going to change your vote away from Hillary to who? Well, <laughs> California know? doesn't matter anyway because she won it anyway. So, well, yeah, but anyway, really, yeah, I mean, this. I I don't you know of course how I feel is I don't believe there should be a, a government period. But it's still, when it comes to things like that, it's like you know either you don't believe in the president or you do. Don't pick and fucking choose. 
or you believe in paying taxes or you don't. Don't fucking pick and choose like, well, if they're president, I'll pay taxes. You know what I mean? So right. it's, it's bullshit. So um, anyway, that's all the time we have for tonight. As always, uh, I appreciate you coming on. I always enjoy the conversations and getting into the detail of a lot of this stuff. I mean, that's why uh, we don't get to some of the things that, because I'd rather – you know, I like getting into the detail of things like the Fed and what goes on with that. And hopefully people, you know, learn more or learn something um, when you're on and, and we talk about uh, some of these things. So, uh, again, always appreciated. Tune in to Ken uh, Mondays and Wednesdays for sure. Sometimes Friday. I feel like I'm talking about why, you know, uh, being a vowel or whatever. Um, or is it the I before E? I don't know. It's, uh, oh yeah. And some, no, it's the vowels. It's A E I O U and sometimes Y. <laughs> just blame, just blame the Russians. Everybody it's else Monday, is. Wednesday, and sometimes Friday. So, uh, definitely listen to Ken's show on YouTube, Ken Shorjan, and check him out at the daily So, uh, thanks again. And we'll be back. Well, Ken will be back uh, two weeks from today. Probably next year because the 28th, well, I'm going to be that's true. vacationing. We're getting to, uh, so, so yeah. So, uh, we will uh, see you next year then, I guess, because I don't know if I'm even doing a show then either. So, um, but Ken will be back at some point. <laughs> it might be the fourth or something, but he'll be back at some point, um, on Wednesday. So usually every other Wednesday, uh, Ken will be here. So, but sometimes sync things come up, but anyway, thank you for tuning in as always. I appreciate it. And, uh, we'll be back tomorrow, uh, to, I'm planning on discussing, individualism versus collectivism so um we'll be talking about that and i will i guess see everybody tomorrow or everybody will hear me tomorrow that tunes in thanks everybody have a good night he will defend his police officers Listen to police officers' commands. Listen to what we tell you.